Here we go. Good morning, everyone. I got one good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it is good to see you, Calvary. How about we all stand together? God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to all come together and to worship you and to lift up the name of Jesus. We pray that this morning you would speak to us through your word. And we pray that we will not leave this building the same way that we came in. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. amen. It's really exciting. It's, it's good stuff. There's a couple announcements that we have before we continue singing, and I'm appreciative to Ricky and Debbie and John leading us in worship this morning. But a couple announcements I want to draw your attention to in your bulletins, okay? The month of July is just around the corner, and in July, there are some things that as a church, we are beginning to add into our schedule. 
Um, so I want to point out those few things um, so you will have them and be ready to participate. On July 24, we're doing a community carnival at uh, Ratliff Park. So this is for a kids program. We obviously did not do VBS this year, but we want to uh, administer the gospel to children in our community. So that is happening on July 24. That's uh, 3 o'clock start time, and we need volunteers. We need you, Calvary, to participate. Um, so today is the day of demarcation. Today is the time you get to start signing up for that and to participate. So if you say, hey, I love kids, I love Jesus, I love to tell kids about Jesus, then we want you to, be able to participate in that event. Um, sign up today back at the Welcome Center. Um, also, the week before that, July 19, we're in a little bit different uh, routine as a church right now. So on the 19th is our annual church business meeting, and it will be held in the evening at 6 p.m. So I encourage you to put that date on your calendar. Think to yourself, hey, I can, I'm going to plan to be there. We, um, we have two different services right now, as you know, and sometimes that creates two different congregations. So that evening, 6 o'clock, hopefully we have everybody together. And uh, we can celebrate what the Lord is doing, has done uh, in Calvary through us, through our, min our ministries. So have that on your calendar as well, July 19, 6 o'clock in the evening. Then the other um, opportunity coming in July is Junior Church. So last month, or this month actually, we started offering nurseries again at the 1030 service time. And so in July, starting next week, Junior Church is going to be starting up again um, at the 1030 service time. So for those families who say, I want to participate in that, uh, that will be available. And um, normally we would have the kids join you for the singing, and then they would be dismissed uh, partway through the service. For this uh, version of Junior Church, they're going to be, uh, you're going to actually deliver them right there um, in the fellowship hall at 1030 and then make your way into the auditorium for the worship service, okay? So a little bit different routine than what we have done, um, but for parents who want to participate, for kids who say, Mom and Dad, I want to participate, then um, that starts next week for the 1030 service, okay? So, um, and if you love sitting together as worshiping as families, then come to the 9 o'clock service. That will still be going on. And then 1030, your kids can go to junior church. And you can come to the second service. Or maybe talk to Julie George or Sandy Stapleton, and they'll be like, we'll put you in, we'll, 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 you'd be a volunteer for Junior Church. It'll be great. Um, so that is happening. So July 24, today you get to sign up to serve if you'd like to. Looking for a lot of volunteers to help minister the gospel to kids in our area. July 19, our annual business meeting in the evening. And then next Sunday, July 5, begins Junior Church at the 1030 service. Um, so take special note of those, those opportunities, and let's be the church, let's be Jesus in our community, and take opportunity where we can to serve um, those that we come in contact with. I'm going to pray for us, and then we will continue in our singing. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the day that we can come, we can, um, we can just simply rejoice that your grace is truly enough as, as it's been extended to us through the gift of the Lord Jesus by the power of your spirit and we can meet together and just rejoice what we have in Christ. What a privilege, what a blessing. Thank you for the gift of your grace. Thank you for the gift of salvation and how it now calls us to a lifestyle of expectation, of a different perception of the world, a different calling to go out and draw others to you. Lord, I pray that we would be a church who is defined by the name of Jesus, who is defined by the desire to please him, and everything that comes from our lips, everything that comes through our actions, might draw people to 
the Lord Jesus. That's my prayer for us this morning. Help us as we continue to worship you this morning, Lord, that you might remove the distractions that we come here with this week. You might help to wash us clean by your word, by the singing, by the sounds of your people lifting up praise to you, Lord, that we might honor you truly with our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you guys stand with us?
with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Amen. with real eyes, amen? Even so, come Lord Jesus. You guys may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Ah, vacations. Have you had one yet? Your nervous chuckle is saying, maybe we need 
We all need to go on vacation together. I don't know about together, maybe. Maybe just uh, vacations. Or maybe you're still quarantining. Is that what you're saying, Ross? Well, you're here, so we're glad to see you there, brother. Vacations, you think through destinations, dates, the people you're going to go with, family reunions, the whining that can happen. Are we there yet? That never happens in our family. The arguments, woo it's so exciting. Ah, the memories, right? Um, so we dream, we count down, and then we launch, right, into vacation. Uh, for our family, vacation for us is right around the corner. We're looking forward to spending some time with my extended family. And then uh, we get to attend family camp at Scioto Hills Camp, a.k.a. Scioto Thrills. So for those of you who've ever been to Scioto Hills, I, and you should go. You should go back. For those who've never been, you should go. And it was, it'd be a thrill. We could all meet there together. It'd be great. You're like, get on with this, get to the point. All right. In the Old Testament Israel, the Jews would take uh, what kind of amounts to a vacation. Um, three times a year, they would take a religiously driven trip, very specific, so that they would uh, learn to love their God and learn to be great, more greatly defined by his presence in their lives. Uh, and there are some psalms that actually um, teach us or start to inform the readers of the Bible um, just what these folks were doing and what was in their mind as they went along. So I'm going to invite you to turn to Psalm 130 in your Bibles. And uh, while you are turning, we, um, we are going to spend a little bit of time talking about the Psalms of Ascent. It's a group of songs in the, uh, the Jewish hymnal called the Book of Psalms um, that range from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. And in your Bibles, every psalm begins with the phrase, a song of ascent. And so you can group them together easily and understand what these are. And um, so we'll spend the, our time just talking a little bit about what these were specifically to Psalm 130, but then how that can um, help us in today's culture. So, in order to, uh, these Jews, uh, they would make travel plans visiting Jerusalem uh, to celebrate three festivals. You know them as Passover, Pentecost, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, they would pack up the family in their caravans and minivans, and they would embark upon a pilgrimage that would help guide them along in their faith. As they make this trek, worshipers along the way could be heard singing, perhaps, reciting, or even chanting certain things along the way, specific songs that were found in the book of Psalms. Um, they would accompany them on their journey, and they would help to cause them to reorient their perceptions of the world, which is a very key understanding when we come to Scripture. We ought not approach this book to say, let me tell you what I think of you. Rather, we ought to approach this book rather humbly and say, okay, you instruct me how I should think. Um, and that's what the Psalms of Ascent were designed to do, to help the Jews as they approached Jerusalem, and quite literally as they ascended up to Jerusalem, those who've been to Israel might understand, oh, Jerusalem itself is, is set up on a, on a mountain, and the land around forces the, uh, the person going there to actually physically go up in elevation to it. So then you have two things happening. One, this these songs that cause our minds to look to God in the heavens, but also as you make the, make the walk towards the holy city, you're literally looking up. There it is, up there. And it's, it's before you um, as you make your way up. 
We read about uh, one such journey in the New Testament, and you'll know the story of the life of Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, his parents, Joseph and Mary, have made pilgrimage. It's Passover festival, and they have arrived at Jerusalem, and um, they go through their celebration of Passover, and then on their way home, they realize Jesus is not with them, right? And so they do an about face, and they head back to Jerusalem. They find him teaching in the temple. Um, But the statement there in Luke 2, you can read it, um, verses 41 to 50, that they made this annual pilgrimage, and they would arrive, they would plan as a family to go to Jerusalem and make it part of their their religious experience. Um, You and I are not much different except we don't go to worship three times a year. We come to worship every week. And as you approach this day, this moment, I'm sure there are certain activities that you choose to do to prepare yourself to go and worship. Um, Like, not or not unlike the Jewish nation as they would head to Jerusalem. For them, it becomes a tangible memory who visit the holy city, they hear songs being sung, they see with their eyes the raised city that comes over the hill as they head towards it. Um, Today's city in Jerusalem, you can see the beautiful uh, golden dome of the rock, and it is an iconic image to say, that's Jerusalem. Um, Those pilgrims on pilgrimage, those worshipers, as they came to the holy city, would be looking for that kind of uh, sign that said, there it is, we've almost arrived. And uh, I've been to Israel, but it's been like 25, maybe 35 years. I'm just that old. But Lowell and Cindy, if you ever want to know what it's like, just talk to Lowell and Cindy after the service, and uh, they will tell you everything that you can you'd like to know. So is that okay? You guys, yeah. Would you like to meet like down front and have a big, yeah. It really is a beautiful um, place to go. And as a Christian, um, when you're there, this book ceases to just be pages and binding with bulletins stuffed in. Instead, it comes alive and you're like, wow, I'm walking where Jesus walked. What a, what a thing. What an, what an amazing reality and privilege. So, you have made your way to Psalm 130. There are 15 of these Psalms of Ascent. Each one begins with the phrase, like we mentioned, a song of ascents. And they run from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. So, what is the purpose behind this section of of the book of Psalms, and how can it help us living in 2020 in our modern education, our sophisticated mindset, our Western way of thinking as Americans, how can an ancient book teach us today? Well, I'll tell you how it does. The same Holy Spirit who wrote this is alive and and among us and indwelt within us, and so he uses this ancient text to awaken our hearts and our eyes, our minds, to what he is saying to the world. And so then this book becomes alive for every generation who reads it. Amen? It's not just history that we can say, look at that happened way back when, and we're going to be really great historians. This is current. This is right now. So let's pay attention to what God is saying to us through this text. Um, One aside, I want to give credit to a little book called Journey to Joy by Josh Moody. If you are a note taker, you can write this title down. This book is more like a devotional that takes every chapter through the Psalms of Ascent. And so if you say, wow, this has opened up, this sermon has opened up a new way of Uh, looking at the Psalms, or even just you want to dig a little further than what we're going to go for our time this morning, I would encourage you to find this book. You can get it digitally. You can also uh, get it from me if you'd like to borrow it. Um, Journey to Joy by Josh Moody, uh, The Psalms of Ascent. 
So these work together, these psalms, as a group to provide the worshiper with a vision that's greater than the one usually set before their eyes. Like all of us who live in this world and breathe its attitude, we need eyes heavenward and hearts that are full of God's word and his spirit in order to rise above the atmosphere of our culture, which I don't know if you've felt this lately, but our culture can be somewhat toxic at times. The Jews who lived during this period surely would struggle in the same way as we do today, um, frustrated by their own society around them and the sin that could become so evident in their own people. Uh, it's an assumption to think that um, the Jews living through here, that the whole nation of Israel in one collective movement made pilgrimage to the holy city. So we have to backtrack a little bit in our minds and think, these people were religious Jews, and they lived next door to some non-religious Jews, and maybe some Canaanites down around the cul-de-sac, but probably primarily this is a Jewish nation that is a that is filled up or made, uh, made mostly of fellow Jews, who you can then make the assumption all Jews are alike. All are just as equally religious and as equally interested in God's presence in their life. We would never make those same assumptions as Americans living in quote-unquote Christian nation where we assume of things about our neighbors who may go to church or may not go to church, and we, we take our religious understanding and our passion for the Lord and we superimpose it onto them. So here, when we read this material, you have to put yourself in their shoes and say, okay, similar to how my community is not necessarily as full of the Spirit as I am, or similar to how my community is not so spiritually minded as I am, this, these pilgrims, these worshipers of Jews who are heading to Jerusalem, are coming out from a society that is the same. It's also secularized. Much of the Old Testament, in fact, reminds us that there are high places set up so that people will go and worship Baal, in the midst of people worshiping Yahweh. Wow. We need to keep that in the back of our minds as you hear some of these phrases, and it will help us, I think, for our understanding today. So these folks, I think, anyway, my one uh, small opinion, the Jews would surely struggle in the same way as we do today, frustrated by their own society around them, and the sin that can be so, become so evident in their own people. But for those who would make the trip, they take it upon themselves to perceive a greater vision for God's glory and his presence in the world. Each song, then, of these, this group of songs of ascent would remind the singer to look for Yahweh, look for the Lord, the God of Israel, to place their hope in him and him alone, he is the one who provides, who restores, who forgives, who unifies, he protects, and he makes promises for the future, um, such as peace, for the city of peace. Have you ever thought about the word Jerusalem? You know the Hebrew word shalom, it's peace. Jeru is the word city, so the call from Psalm 122 is pray for the peace of the city of peace, <laughs> that God's presence would be manifested but not just peace, but also the promised Messiah. Psalm 132 talks about the anointed one and David's, uh, David's family is going to have someone to sit on the throne. And so as these pilgrims make their way to Jerusalem, it's almost as if God takes, uh, uses like a hot shower to just clean them. Clean them from the distractions. Wash them from the world system. To wash them from the sin that has clinged so tightly to them. Does that sound kind of like a New Testament passage to you? What does Hebrews 12 say? To run the race 
and remove the sin that so clings tightly and the distractions. This is what the worshipers on the way to Jerusalem are doing as they're singing and chanting and reciting the songs of ascent. So let's hear just a few phrases from, from these psalms. I'm, I will just read them to you. Um, Psalm 120 says, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me, Oh, Yahweh, rescue me from lying lips and a deceitful tongue. So the reader of the Bible might say, Well, who has the lying lips? Well, one answer might be the Canaanites, those rascally Canaanites that never got driven out. Or the lying lips are my fellow Jews who just don't care about God. Wow. Show us favor, Psalm 123 says. Oh, Yahweh, show us favor. We've had more than enough contempt. We've had more than enough scorn from the arrogant, contempt from the proud. These worshipers on their way to Jerusalem, to the holy city, long to be made holy and to have their, uh, their souls washed clean from the sin around them, the society that is just dragging them down. Psalm 124 even gets a little bit more pointed. Uh, Blessed be the Lord who has not let us be ripped apart by their teeth. We've escaped like a bird from the hunter's net. The net's torn, but we have escaped. It's like on the, the clutches of the death throes or whatever. It's like they're rushing out. It's almost as if the worshiper, as they sing this song, you can see them along as they're traveling, and behind them is the city that they just came out of. And they're like, oh, we barely escaped, praise the Lord, but we're on our way to Jerusalem where God, wherein God dwells and righteousness is there. Lord, take us, wow. We barely escaped with our lives. That's Psalm 124. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. It cannot be shaken, it remains forever. The mountains surround Jerusalem and the Lord surrounds his people both now and forevermore like a big hug. For those who have been to Israel, you know that there's, a va- there's two valleys that surround it, and there's mountains on the, uh, around those. You have the Mount of Olives overlooking the city, the Kidron Valley, and then the Hinnom Valley, and you have mountain ranges kind of circling the city. It's a great city to have to defend if you're in the ancient culture. Uh, where you're, you're raised up, there's valleys in between you, and so the psalmist acknowledges God is as if he's got two arms wrapped around this city. Isn't it Jesus who said something like, oh, that like a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, I would love to gather you up, my people Israel, as Jesus sits there or looks on the Mount of Olives over the holy city. That's what Psalm 125 is, is reflecting here. Psalm 126 says, Restore our, for, our fortunes, O Lord, like water courses in the desert. Wow, those who soar and sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. You've seen, you've seen images of deserts as water infiltrates into that dry land and, and the green, lush uh, vegetation that grows up. It's quite fascinating, actually, how that happens Um, And when you see it, that's what is in the mind of these people as they're making their way to the holy city. They anticipate that when I get to the holy city, I'm going to meet with God, and that's going to change my perspective about the world I live in. I'm going to meet with God, and that's going to change my perspective about the world I live in. Some of us need to be called to meet with God today. We need to change the perspective about the world in which we live. And I pray that today, this moment, as we read in a a minute of Psalm 130, you will hear God's words and you will say, I've met with my God. And that now changes how I'm going to live my life, how I'm going to talk, how I'm going to post, because meeting God must change everything. Amen? Amen. So let's read Psalm 130. Out of the depths I call to you, O my Lord. Listen to my voice. Let let your ears be attentive to my cry for help. Lord, if you kept an account of iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there's forgiveness, so that you may be revered. 
I wait for the Lord. I wait and put my hope in his word. I wait for the Lord more than watchman for the morning. More than the watchman for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For there is faithful love with him. With him is redemption in abundance. And he will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Would you pray with me for a moment? Our Father God, as we take a moment to just hear from you out of your word, may it shape our hearts to live for you, to hope in you, and to reflect the love of the Lord Jesus that, to those around us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Just a couple observations I want to pull out before we're done. Out of the depths I call to you. This is a person who is overwhelmed overwhelmed with the sin of society around them. And I wonder if there might be some of us here today who could say the same exact thing. I am overwhelmed with the sickness of society around me. You're crying the same, the, the same cry. Out of the depths, I cry to you. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry. Lord, if, if you kept an account of iniquities, oh, who could stand? When Jesus dies on the cross, and he's hanging there, and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is something that happens in the temple. The veil is torn in two. And we tend to assume that that gives us access to God, and certainly it's true. But before that happens, God has access to the Lord Jesus, who is the sacrificial lamb for all of humanity. And it's almost as if in that moment the veil is torn, God's wrath is applied to the Lord Jesus as he's hanging on the cross, and Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled as he looks down through time. He sees Messiah, and he is so disfigured, he doesn't even look like a human being. Wow. And the psalmist says, if, if you marked our iniquities, who could stand? Well, only the Lord Jesus could stand. All of us would be lost forever. God's wrath would be overwhelming because of iniquity. But there is hope because he goes on, but with you there is forgiveness so that you may be feared, you may be revered, honored, respected, put your word in there. We rest in God's goodness, amen? I don't rest in my forgiveness for myself. Our culture says you need to get past something, just forgive yourself and move on. That is looking inward for a problem that can only be fixed outside of myself. And so the psalmist directs my perspective, sends my vision heavenward, and says, only God truly forgives, and I need to rest in his forgiveness. And then he turns a corner from, from rest for in his forgiveness to hope in his word of forgiveness. Look at the very next verse. I wait for the Lord. I put my hope in his word. If God has truly forgiven, then don't doubt what he has said. Live in his goodness to us, his forgiveness he has offered to us. Amen? So many times, sin comes with shame that we feel and guilt that's applied, and we, just, we, de we define ourselves by that. But as Christians, as those who believe in a greater vision of God's glory, when God says, you're forgiven, live in that forgiveness. Put your hope in that. Don't look back. Be like Lot. Move forward. Not like Lot's wife who looked back. So many of us, sometimes we just get caught in the cycle because we think forgiveness is based on my ability to forgive myself. Psalmist says, put your hope in God, turn your attention to him, what he's doing, 
and then trust in it and don't make another move. Wow. I wait for the Lord. I wait and put my hope in His Word. His waiting goes so far to say that some of us have third shift jobs and we can't wait till that shift is over. We can head home and, and fall asleep in our beds. Like a watchman who waits for the morning, and then the psalmist repeats it, like a watchman who waits for the morning, thinking like, wow, we've all been there in those late shifts and we can't wait till that shift comes to an end. And it's as if I'm in that position, I'm waiting for the Lord to answer, to come, to restore, to redeem, refresh, reorient. This is the attitude of the pilgrim as they make their way to the holy city of Jerusalem. And it should be our attitude as well as we meet for, with God in this moment, as we wake up to a new day and all things new in the, in the morning as the sun rises. We're reminded of God's goodness to us. Then he comes to a corporate understanding at the end. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For there is hesed. Uh, that is another Jewish term that all Christians ought to know. Shalom, we understand, is the word for peace. Hesed is the word for covenant loyalty. God has hesed with us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And because the blood of Jesus Christ is shed on our behalf, we can trust that he will be faithful to his covenant with us through it. He calls Israel as a nation, put your hope in the Lord. With him there is redemption in abundance, and he will redeem Israel from her iniquities. That is a promise, perhaps a promise yet to come, could have been realized in the coming of the Lord Jesus himself as he dies on the cross and rises from the dead. But it's a promise for the church today to say, oh church, put your hope in the Lord. He will redeem. He is the great redeemer. And there will be a day that he returns and he will restore all that we see. That should be our perspective going forth in life. So then whatever we read in the news, whatever we read on Facebook, whatever we read, wherever, if it's not Scripture, put it in its box, put it in its category, and say, well, that's nice, but God is here, and this is going to drive me to the city, to the holy city, where God is and he is going to set aright my view of the world so that I can live for him. And I can call others to follow me as I live for him. That's our calling. These songs of ascent, they, they call us to a greater vision of who God is and me as a human being that he has welcomed, welcomed into his family to say, come, follow me as I follow Christ. Amen? Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand, and I want to read in benediction Psalm 134. It's the final song of ascent. It's as if the pilgrims have made their journey, and they have arrived in the holy city, perhaps even the temple itself. And you might hear a priest or followers saying and singing these words, Now bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand in the Lord's house by night. Lift up your hands in the holy place and bless Yahweh. May the Lord, maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. Let's be men and women, young and old, who set our affections on things that are greater beyond us. Amen? And let's, let's call people, those around us, to that same vision. Would you pray with me a moment? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the day, for the reminder that your scripture gives us to set our affections on things above, not on earthly things. We have been called out. We are citizens of heaven. And like the pilgrims of old, the, the Jews, as they made way to Jerusalem, they had to set aside the distractions and the sinful pleasures and the society that was around them so they could have a full view of what, who you are and how you have revealed yourself and called them to a lifestyle that brings you glory. 
May we be the same. Lord, by your spirit, give us, uh, give us the strength to, lay, to rest our hope in you alone. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.